Rose and welcome to the Rose Bush. My name is Ally Rose. Thank you so much for bearing her ultra dark. Uh, if you're not subscribed, well, that's your choice. That's your decision. Um, not twist on your arm or anything. But uh, it's fun here. I have fun um, with my bush. So, welcome to my garden. Uh, what am I doing? I am reacting. We're going to take a gander. Yeah, I don't know why I'm looking at, I don't know why I'm looking over here. That's why I'm looking over here. We're going to go ahead and take a gander uh, at Ren's stories. Uh, he recently, about over a month ago, at least at the time I'm filming this, uh, put out a bunch of stories, a bunch of chapters, and I haven't watched them yet. So, let's watch them together. And let's elaborate on it. Uh, because I'm a storyteller, I'm a writer, um, I've been thinking about some things, actually, I'll take this opportunity, just to be right here with chapter one, I'll just take this opportunity to say that I've had somebody, really it's only one person so far, um, connect with me over social media, one of my subscribers, and we've just, we chit chat every now and again, uh, but this person recently shared a story with me, um, and it really got me thinking. I have a lot of stories, poems, things like that that I've written throughout my life that I, I think I want to share with you all, uh, because I think they're great. <laughs> um, but that also leads me to, I would love to share your stories if you would, if you would have me. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, all kinds of stories, short stories, long stories, poetry, Spoken word, like, it, there's really no limit on your story. It's your story, whether it's fiction or not, or nonfiction, or or a story about cryptids. I don't, I don't really care. Um, I just don't, don't be mean to me, obviously, and be nice about other people. So don't send me stories that are hateful and rude and disrespectful and nasty and disgusting. Don't do that. Don't do that to me. So if, if you would like to send me a story for me to read, because I think I'm going to go ahead and move forward with this as like a new segment, please feel free to send me an email. It's rosecosmoswriter at gmail.com, and I will put it here for you as, lo as well as in the caption. Uh, and please let me know in the email if I have your permission to use your real name your screen name, <laughs> your screen name, what is it called? I don't know what it's called on YouTube. <laughs> you know, give me, let me know if I have your permission to use your name and if you would like that. Um, or if you just want me to read your story, please include that as well as knowing that I will read your story as written. Please, please, for the love of everybody, proofread it before you send it to me. Okay. Because if it sounds weird, I'm going to read it and it's going to sound weird. You know what I'm saying? Okay. So let's get into it. I'm rambling. Let's go. Ha. <sighs> Hello, everyone. Uh, this is the first time I've done something like this before. I wanted to write it down because there's a lot and I didn't want to miss anything. And um, some parts of this might be a little bit uncomfortable to listen to, but I wanted to stay as true as possible to the story, not miss anything. Um, for the sake of people who might be going through something similar or for the sake of people who don't but want to help understand a little bit more. Perfect. Yeah. I promise that everything in this story is 100% true. Nothing is exaggerated for dramatic effect. Some names I don't mention and some details I don't go too far into or downplay them for the sake of the people around me. Timelines might occasionally be a little bit off, but that's just because I've had to write everything from memory from a time that was quite hazy. I ask before embarking on this journey with me that you all respect the privacy of myself and the people around me. You might be compelled to reach out to some of the people that I mention, cast judgment, praise them, criticize them, and I ask you kindly not to. It's my choice to be in the public eye, and it's mine alone. This is the first time my story is on the public record in a concise way. Being in the public eye is strange. The more that I give to you, the less that I get to keep for myself. Mm. I don't find the experience of sharing particularly enjoyable. I don't so much l like the questions that follow. I'm going to pause it right there. And if you have a problem with the fact that I paused it, 
It's your problem. <laughs> um, I'm going to pause it because I know I need to pause because he's going to be telling his stories and I'm going to have thoughts. And if I don't tell, if I don't pause it, it's just going to go away. I'm going to forget because my brain. I personally, when I decide to share things with people and, and moving forward when I do do that, um, I will probably sound and be uh, like Ren in this. Heavy breathing, uh, nervousness, his palms are probably sweaty, he's probably getting really hot. I mean, that's these are things that I experience when I'm verbally speaking or telling things or sharing, uh, sharing things. Like, for example, I shared a journal entry with my therapist and the entire time reading it I was I was vi physically shaking it, as if I had chills as if I was cold but I'm not it's just my nervous system uh that ang anxiety nervousness to all kinds of you know things going on in your body uh, so I'm just all I'm saying is that I really relate to how his body is reacting is being and I'm not a medical expert, so I don't like to be as some, seen as somebody with all the answers, because I don't have them. And because of the empathy that I feel I'm compelled to try and help as many people as possible, but the last time I opened myself up to this on a one-on-one -on -one basis, I was surrounded by a lot of death, and there simply weren't enough hours in the day. So I ask you, if you need support, please reach out to a professional or use my music as your companion. I share my story in hopes that somebody who needs it finds it, that it provides hope, that it might ease the suffering for the people like me. I like my solitude, so I ask that anyone who respects the work I make and respects my contribution to the world to respect my solitude. <laughs> a lot happened in my teenage years, and I didn't live the most normal of lives, but I'll save that story for another time. The important thing to contextualise this story is that I was full of life. I was full of a burning desire to change the world. The flaws in how we interact seemed obvious to me. I believed in people's power to change the unnecessary suffering we inflict upon ourselves. I was also enamoured with music. Music is the closest thing to God that I have. It's a gateway to the unexplainable and it's a way of communicating the inexpressible. There's just one moment that I wanted to share with you from the years before I got sick. I was 17 and I felt indestructible. I'm not sure why, but my whole life I had this feeling inside myself that I was meant to do something important, not for myself, not for praise, not for personal gain, but something that would change the world for the better. It's hard to describe it without coming across like an egomaniac or having some sort of God complex, but I felt like I had some sort of divine purpose. And I remember feeling this so strongly that one afternoon after school, I stood in the center of my bedroom and I spoke loud into an empty void. I said that I would single-handedly take on and defeat the forces of evil, and I welcomed them to try their best. Throughout the years, that memory stuck with me, taunting me sometimes. Flash forward to 2019. I remember the first day I knew something was wrong very well. I woke up in an unfamiliar room in Cardiff, feeling like a raven had perched itself upon my heart. Every time my heart beat, it's like some part of me was aware of the foreboding death sentence that was to come. Some sort of primal instinctive dread. Everything felt wrong and I felt prosthetic, like I could tear my own skin off and observe though I was watching passively from another room. The night before, I'd been in Cardiff visiting friends in university. It was the end of summer, we'd gone out to a few bars. I wasn't really enjoying myself. That year, I'd been struggling with social anxiety, perhaps from years of abusing my brain with a whole pick and mix and selection of party drugs. Engaging with society felt like stepping into the ring with a heavyweight champion. Every single fucking question felt like an oncoming haymaker I had to socially navigate because of my very limited toolkit of charisma at the time. I don't know why I cared about being liked so much, but the more I cared, the less equipped I became to have a simple human conversation. I used to deal with this by getting fucking hammered. That night was no exception. I got smashed, lost my phone, and woke up in a strange apartment. In the bed opposite mine was a snoring rugby player and his girlfriend. Everything- He seems... Almost... Like, I could tell that this, that this part of his, this time in his life weighs heavy on his heart. And that just comes through. It, it really does. Everything just seemed off, and it wasn't a hangover. My first thought was I'd been spiked. I quietly gathered all my belongings and left before anyone could wake up and punch me with a conversation. I wandered around the grey Cardiff in a haze, feeling like I've just been rigged up to an IV bag full of ketamine and cyanide. And okay. That's Killian Murphy. <laughs> that is so funny.
funny that he's using a still from 28 days later. <laughs> because he looks like Killian Murphy. I'm sorry I'm shouting. I just, I love that. And I'm a movie buff. I'm going to rewind it. And the whole world just seemed off. I wandered around a grey Cardiff in a haze feeling like I've just been rigged up to an IV bag full of ketamine and cyanide. And the whole world just seemed off. Like I was looking at it through a tunnel. A heavy feeling of fear clung around me like a straitjacket. The only comforting thought was that with enough time, rest and water, it would pass. But it didn't. For eight long years, it didn't. And this is my story of an eight year long nightmare. I returned back to my dad's home. He was living with his partner at the time. It wasn't my home, so I already felt uncomfortable and out of place. These unusual symptoms persisted. I figured I'd caught some sort of virus and I'd get better with time. But by the end of the week, things were a lot worse. I took myself to the doctor and he said he thought it sounded viral, that if I went home and got enough rest, it would eventually pass. And it didn't. For eight years, it didn't. I returned for my second year of university. My brain was full of fog. And my I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just find that incredibly ridiculous. Um... Like, your body needs help if it's viral. It's not just going to go away. So that's like... That makes me really mad. Us. And it didn't. For eight years, it didn't. I returned from my second year of university. My brain was full of fog and my body felt poisoned. There were intermittent days where I felt like a hollow suit of skin. I'd sit in lectures unable to focus and was devoid of any sort of personality. I'd be able to have basic conversations, yeses and noes, but I was stripped of the ability to think spontaneously. It's like my body was taking up so much processing power being sick that I could not have original or spontaneous thought. The most peculiar thing about this was there was a me that was aware that this was all happening and was observing it from outside of myself, locked out, screaming silently, banging on the walls of my mind to be let in and never successfully. And nonetheless, there I was, like a ghost haunting myself. My usual routine was getting home, running a shower and curling up into a ball to cry underneath the running water, not understanding what was going on. I brought myself to the doctors numerous times during this period, re requesting every blood test they'd let me have, often being dismissed and told things like stress from university can cause strange symptoms. But how come no one I knew in university could relate to this? Eventually, I was put on a six month long waiting list to see a mental health specialist who did a short one page questionnaire and wrongly diagnosed me as hypercycling bipolar and put me on a course of citalopram. After a few weeks, it stole my ability to sleep. I was told to stick it out and it would level out and eventually I'd feel more like myself. I stuck it out and I got worse and I pulled myself off it after two weeks of, in a row of sleepless nights and insomnia. I mean, he has all of these physical symptoms and they write him off and say it's mental, which I'm not arguing against that. It's just take a look at him, give him a physical exam, T put your body, put your body on his body. You know what I mean? Touch him. I, I mean, I, I mean, I'm in the U S and our healthcare system is a giant puzzle that doesn't fit, okay? So I can only imagine what y'all deal with over in the UK. There's something pretty peculiar about being told you're in some sort of spectrum of madness, even if you suspect that you're mad. Your diagnosis finds a way to claw itself into your identity, even if it doesn't belong to you. Ever since I was a child, I'd always be asking what and why and how things worked. I couldn't really accept things as they were without knowing how. I carried into this into my adult years and so as the bipolar hammer crashed and sentenced itself into my reality, I began searching online for behaviours associated with it, people's first hand experiences, what it felt like to be manic. In these early I'm sorry, I need to rewind this because I'm dealing with a ice pick headache right now. It's hitting me hard and I'm not able to focus. So I'm just gonna rewind. Okay. <sighs> That's why I was going like this, because I don't really have control. Um, okay, sorry about that. I carried into, this, into my adult years, and so as the bipolar hammer crashed and sentenced itself into my reality, I began searching online for behaviors associated with it, people's first-hand experiences, what it felt like to be manic. 
In these earlier days of my illness, the symptoms would fluctuate in severity day by day. Some days I'd be in the thick, tired fog, and other days they'd be more merciful. I began to associate the days of not suffering as mania and would act more erratically on the days that my symptoms were less bothersome. I did things like climbing out of windows of a six-story student accommodation or get so drunk I'd wake up outside of the university campus lawn. But it wasn't mania. I just wasn't hurting. I spent one day a week with my therapist, who was teaching me cognitive behavioural therapy. The issue was, mentally reframing unexplainable symptoms caused a lot of cognitive dissonance for me. I was told my anxiety or depression was causing my symptoms, but in reality it was my symptoms which were making me anxious and depressed. So I was in some sort of inescapable bind. I'd devotedly work on my mental health, following every new tool for coping to the letter, only to have my symptoms get worse, which made me frustrated, raise the intensity of my treatment, only to get even more frustrated as my body seemed to deteriorate. After six months, I told my mum I'd happily saw off my own leg with a blunt knife if it meant my symptoms would vanish, and I meant it. I told her if I had to live with this strange feeling for one more year, I'd kill myself, and I meant that too. But something happened that winter which showed me firsthand the horrors and the fallout from suicide. Mm. I met Joe when I was nine years old. I remember the first time clearly. I was standing in his living room when he turned to me and he was like, watch this. Then he proceeded to climb on top of his sofa and did a front flip onto a stone living room floor. He landed on his back and lay motionless for a few seconds before grinning, getting up and then doing it all over again. We grew up terrorizing the streets of the small village we grew up in, playing knock door run or breaking into people's gardens to play on their trampolines. We stayed friends throughout high school, going through various phases together. Joe was comedian of the group. I remember countless mornings after messy all night as Joe would be cracking endless jokes like a professional stand-up routine and we'd all be in tears laughing. When I started writing my first songs, Joe and Sega were the first people who always knew every word and they would sing along at the top of their lungs. They gave me a lot of self-belief and they helped me build the foundation of what I do today and I owe them a lot for that. That Christmas, I came back home to Wales from university. On Christmas Eve, me and Joe were sat in a pub and he turned to me and he told me that, he fan that he'd fantasised about walking into the sea until he was totally submerged. He had a pretty morbid sense of humour so I didn't really take him as seriously as I should have. Two days later, it's 3am and I get a phone call. It's my friend Ella. She tells me that Joe is on the bridge by my house. He was drunk, he'd called her up, and he told her he was gonna jump. I was still half asleep. I fumbled, pulling on whatever clothes I could that were near, and I walked out of the front door, and the winter air stung my face, and it woke me up. Adrenaline kicked in, and I started sprinting towards the bridge. It was about a five minute walk, a two and a half minute sprint. As I was running, I dialed Joe's number, and I get a busy tone, and I felt relief, because it meant he was still alive. I kept hitting redial as I ran, and as I got about halfway to the bridge, the busy tone changes. I get an automated voice note saying the number's out of service, and my heart sunk. <laughs> I got to the suspension bridge that connects Anglesey to the mainland, and it usually looks very beautiful. I sprint up and down the bridge, yelling Joe's name, and it's silence, and it's deafening. And I peer over the bridge into the blackness, and the bridge sits about 100 feet above the water. Hitting cold water at that height is like smashing into concrete. And the waters are notoriously dangerous because of the cross current. I hear nothing, no sounds, nothing. I run up and down the bridge about two times before I spot a figure at the end of it. And my heart jumps into my throat and I run towards the figure. And it's my friend Ricky who's had the same call. And we both run around up and down the bridge and around the surrounding area looking for Joe. More of his friends eventually arrive and there's nothing. I was about a minute too late. We spent the next week walking up and down beaches with flashlights. And when it's that dark, every other large rock starts to look like a washed up body. We plastered all the neighboring towns in missing posters, contacting whoever we could, someone who might know something. We checked bank records to see if any money had been withdrawn since he went missing. There was CCTV footage of him walking onto the bridge, but there wasn't any of him coming off. But there were dead zones in the footage, so there was still a small chance he could be alive. I was sleeping about three hours a night, pretty determined that we'd still find him. For about 10 days, we had nothing. And then suddenly a call comes through while, while we're all at my friend Miles' house having food. It's the police. A body had been found in the water by the bridge. We piled into my friend's car. I remember being in the back seat in floods of tears, repetitively punching the back of the passenger seat as we drove to the scene. As we pull up, 
I saw a lifeless body being zipped up into a green bag near a parked ambulance. Its skin was bloated by the seawater, and it wasn't Joe. Someone else decided to jump that day. Joe was never found. It's difficult to truly let go when you can't say goodbye. For months following, I held on to this fantasy that we'd get a call that he'd run away to some European town, and he was happy and he was healthy. But that call never came. The time during his inquest was also around the time I was struggling with the side effects of a new antidepressant. I remember sitting in the courtroom feeling like I was listening to the whole thing deep underwater. The judge felt the circumstances surrounding Joe's death didn't mean the... V uh. The judge felt that the circumstances surrounding Joe's death meant that the verdict was left open. It kind of stung even more to not have an official ruling of suicide. I remember going to visit his mum not long after and witnessing the aftermath of a mother grieving for her baby boy. The silence of his father, the tears of his mother. I decided that day that I'd have to wait until my illness killed me because I couldn't do it by choice. I couldn't put my family through that. Over the next 10 years, I returned to my hometown only a handful of times following Joe's death. My last visit was in the summer of last year. I reconnected with Joe's parents and showed them a song that I'd written, simply entitled For Joe. We cried together, reminisced together, joked, and I'm proud to say that I gave Joe's mum enough money to afford a caravan she told me she'd been saving up for. I felt pretty good. We'd also do a fundraiser for the Royal National Lifeboat Institution, who were integral for searching for Joe during that time, and we raised a pretty good amount of money too. Being able to give back in whatever small way I could felt good, and it felt right for all the years Joe had made us all laugh till it hurt. He was a solid person, just a little lost, as we all are sometimes. And I miss him. Life was about to take an even more unusual turn, and I was about to meet the first angel of this story. So stay tuned for that. from the ground when your wings are cut your stomach burns when you're drinking from an empty cup you know the entire ocean came from my tear ducts i see the world through fibonacci sequences and double dutch i guess there's some that's born lucky there's some that's not i tried to cut away my bitterness hatchet job i locked my youth inside the trunk inside the pickup truck then dumped that whole thing over that same bridge the night you jumped I think about that sometimes, vividly What it felt like to look down and see tranquility One sudden movement in a world of possibility Only one movement to expose our fragility I fucking miss you, and I miss myself I miss thinking we were indestructible as hell I miss chilling by the pier cave and kicking back with Callum Hugo Justin Sega, Stevie and the fucking lads I miss missing that, I numb myself to close the gap I never even call them up Distance is my plaster cast to tell the truth The day you jump, my childhood jump too But I still can't find the anger All I find is missing you, man, I miss you with all my rhymes, I picture running five minutes quicker, I'm right on time I picture pulling you back over the edge and then we're crying And holding you my brother and telling you that it's fine Not the way that it worked, I was late like a jerk There's not a day where I can find a way to break from the hurt Your body missing so we never got to wave to the hearse I hope you're listening, I love you man, I miss you absurd fuck <sighs> Domino it falls, 
Across the way another's born How you're supposed to raise a child And give it courage from a storm In a world that is confusing Contradictions pave our flaws Some will say we're only human Others judge us for our flaws Some get born in sheets of satin Some get by in tattered clothes Some will die before they live That's just how the story goes But for those of us still with us Who reside inside our hearts Tell them proudly how you feel And for those of us who aren't Freckled angels stand strong Freckled angels live on Freckled angels climb higher Freckled angels still inspire Freckled angels won't forget you Teach me to live my life better Thirteen years and still I miss you Now my wings are missing feather Otherwise I'd come and join you But for now I'm here on earth Stuck inside this mortal body But for everything it's worth Made me braver, made me wiser Made me stronger, made me true Made me face the world with courage And that's all because of you Freckled angels laugh the hardest And their hearts, they are the largest With their wings, they fly the farthest So I know you're gonna be okay Freckled angels live the longest And their minds, they are the strongest Oh, their friends, they are the fondest So I know you're gonna be okay So that was intense. Um, I'm just so... It's really... We, ha we as individuals, no matter who it is, we have no right to tell anyone how to grieve. And we have no right to tell anyone how long that process takes. <clears throat> and I, and I, just watching him read his story, I relate so much, not to his story, but just his very being. It's very essence from a storyteller's perspective. Um, the self-soothing, stimming. I, I just, I relate so much. And I'm just in such awe of his talent and his, his, this is why we all need to have more empathy and compassion and understanding for our fellow people because you really have, you just have no idea. And we also have no right to tell anyone that they shouldn't feel how they feel. But yeah, it's not his fault. It's not Ren's fault, but he carries that guilt for not being able to get there. And that weighs heavy on you. And then to not be able to have that closure because you never, you couldn't find him. The only way I can relate that is with true crime in general and all of the people that are missing that have never been recovered. And the families, regardless of the victim leaving of their own volition and self-infliction or someone else doing something nefarious to them, that unknown is so, is, it's one that's deafening and that only you understand as the people on the other side that unknown and not being able to have that closure. It's exhausting. 
and my heart just goes out to him. I just want to hug him. I just want to give him a big old hug, embrace him, and just let him know he's not alone in how he feels. And that is just the main takeaway. Just let others know that you're not alone. Because they're not. So that concludes chapter one. So stay tuned for chapter two. And just remember growth happens one thorn at a time. And it's not always pleasant. But regardless, growth happens. So take care.